Hi, we're very excited to have her join us. Many of you might know Margaret and have completed training with her at some point. She's a Melbourne-based microbiologist and has worked in clinical and research bacterial viral immunology laboratories and has been a lecturer and educator at a tertiary level. She was invited by the RACGP to contribute to the fifth edition infection prevention and control standards and has been educating practices in all things infection control for many years. So please welcome Mark and over to you, Mark. Okay, thank you, Brianna. Thank you, thank you for welcoming me to um, New South Wales. I'm from, you know, toxic Victoria. <laughs> We've just been having a quick discussion. So um, normally, you know, this doesn't, I'm just gonna try and get the light a bit better on this, but I really don't know how it's gonna go, sorry. Um, <clears throat> Normally this is presented without even mention of COVID-19, but of course tonight I'll layer over some of the fundamentals of infection prevention control um, and refer, you know, obviously relate them to COVID. But I was actually reading out to the ladies beforehand about, um, we've had a bit of an uptick the last couple of days. And um, today I note that I just get this report each day 21 new cases. Now, this will happen to the states, it'll happen over the next year. Nobody sort of, we haven't eradicated it. Even poor old New Zealand thought they they're on their way, but they had two people who'd come back for, for compassionate reasons from England um, to see a relative and they were in their 14 day quarantine, but they let them out early to drive down 600 kilometres to drive down to the relative who unfortunately died that night. But guess what? Both women have tested positive. So you can imagine now the work to work out who have they been in contact with and et cetera, et cetera. This is the way it's going to be. So of our, this is the way to look at your numbers. And as I said, it's our turn. It's our turn this, this week, this fortnight, whatever. And we're in unknown territory. I think you guys have just recorded one case today. But um, the way to look at the cases is how many are from people in quarantine, you know, return travellers, people who are being repatriated. Um, and so you can imagine they've been overseas. Really, they should have all been back well and truly by now. I, I'm sort of getting a little bit tired of hearing of people still coming back now. They should have been able to get all back in. There's a point at which if our only cases are those who are coming back, then I think, you know, we need to revisit this. So um, 15 of our 21 are people in hotel quarantine, 15. So uh, then I think you're probably aware we've actually got a case at one of the quarantine hotels where four of the staff, four of the security staff have got it. Well, you know, what's been going on there? I think I know, and it's nothing more insidious than the human thing about, oh, those people up there on the fifth floor that are positive, oh no, we keep away from them. But what the security guards are all doing is probably having a, uh, you know, getting together in the tea room and um, not observing the 1.5 metres distance. So people are mixing up, I think, a little bit, the message of relaxed restrictions. They're actually confusing that with measures and we're not relaxing our measures. So our measures are quite different to our restrictions. Our restrictions are, you know, the loosening of them, you can now gather with more people, but the measures are still the same. Do not go out if you have even the slightest respiratory symptom. That includes you guys. Too often in healthcare, and especially in general practice, the assumption is it's those patients out there who are infectious. Well, I want you to adopt a completely different approach now. What if I'm the one who's infectious? What if I don't even know? What if I'm about to get it and I don't know? What am I doing in my everyday life as well as at work to make sure that I actually don't transmit it? So first thing, when you wake up in the morning, have I got a scratchy throat? Have I got a dry cough temperature? You know, there's about 15, I think, they've added to nose and throat, scratchy eye, red feet or, or itchy feet, whatever. So there's more and more, diarrhea, about 14, 15% of people are presenting with the diarrhea. So you know, check each morning, any of those symptoms overnight, no. Go to work, check each other. You might wanna do a temperature check, but I tell you, sometimes you can just, you know, guess the figure um, on some of those. So you gotta make sure you've got a good 
um, contactless thing. It really is preferred tympanic or oral, but we're just not into that, I don't think, at present. So some of you are using it, but don't just use that. And don't just say to each other, are you well? Because you can feel perfectly well with a bit of a scratchy throat and a dry cough. So I think we're asking the wrong questions. Uh, and still cases are sneaking through that will be transmitted. And so you might say, well, I just had a little bit of a scratchy throat and a dry cough for a couple of hours. I'm okay, that wasn't it. But in the meantime, you've passed it on because you didn't observe the 1.5 metres or you're in your bubble in your house um, and they started to get it, but you said, oh, that's nothing. But then somebody goes and visits somebody who's a transplant, somebody who's already got, you know, comorbidities. You don't have to be ancient to come off second best uh, with this at all. So the measures are stay in when you've got any symptoms, go and get a swab done, regardless of the lightness of the symptom. Stay 1.5 metres from people when you're out. That means really effectively no tea rooms in general practice. Or a lot of the Queensland people, of course Queensland, they've got nice weather, they've set up a little, you know, a couple of palm trees and a couple of seats and a bit of an umbrella and they've made their tea rooms outside. Outside is brilliant. Outside you get unlimited air changes. Do as much as you can outside. I do my gym training outside uh, with my trainer. So um, even though we're keeping 1.5 metres apart, even better outside. And one, so expect cases to pop up. So it's spread, droplet spread. So that gets us into talking about uh, transmission of infection. So you know the main ways, droplet, true airborne and contact. So for something like this, we know that it's droplet and contact spread, which is why everybody's madly running around, you know, cleaning traffic buttons, etc., etc. Um, the virus itself is very easy to inactivate, alcohol hand rub or, you know, bleach for surfaces, etc. So it's not, a, it's not a persistent virus. It doesn't last forever. It's not like norovirus gastro, which is also spread droplets and contact. So it's not a difficult virus to inactivate, but it is in fact more infectious than influenza. So, its uh, dose is time and distance, that you're face to face with somebody, 15 minutes is called close contact. Same room, two hours is close contact. So anybody who's symptomatic, you see the, you see the problem. Okay, um, it looks like the mortality rate is around about, case fatality rate is around about 0 0.8. It could, it's possible that it's lower, the infectious um, fatality rate could be a bit lower, but right now we've just, we just know who the, you know, the cases, the, those who come forward. Um, there was a huge screening, and I think you guys have done it too, um, where we picked up about 20 cases out of 150,000 swabs that were done in Victoria about a month ago. That tells me that it is bubbling along a little bit in the community. We haven't eradicated it. I don't think uh, even the states who've had nothing for a couple of weeks. Don't be surprised if, you know, cases do pop up. That's the way it's going to be because we haven't got a vaccine. So it's probably a bit unfair for the states to point the finger for each other. And not that you want any any state to have, you know, to have any more cases. So droplet transmission means that when I cough, sneeze, etc., the particles that leave me, like mucosaliva if you like, um, the larger particles fall quickly. Okay, and we say fall within one to two metres, but there's evidence that it can easily go out to three, and that can depend on humidity, uh, all those kinds of things. Then of course the particles, the droplets are different sizes, so they're really tiny droplets, or we call dro droplet nuclei, um, dry off a bit and go out a bit further. But they don't tend to have as much in terms of the um, SARS-CoV-2, which is the um, virus, COVID-19 is the disease, they don't of course have as many particles. So that's why we say sort of being further away um, is a lower risk. So it's all you know based on risk. And I think the way to get risk in context is people who think that they can just put a mask on and they're immune, masks are about 85% effective. So there you go, that's a surgical mask and we're not requiring people to wear anything um, for um, airborne precaution. So the only time you would wear, use airborne precautions, which would be a change to a P2 mask, 
would be if the patient had pneumonia and the mask is off and you're wanting to collect a sputum specimen, please don't do that in office based practice. That is really a hospital thing. Or the patients requiring intubation or bronchoscopy, that's where you get massive clouds of you know, high load viral shedding and that's where they would need the P2 mask. Okay, That just means that it stops the smaller bits of spit and snot getting through. But for um, <clears throat> general practice, no, it's the plain um, surgical mask is what is required. I know there are different levels of them. I don't really like to see people in the community wasting some of our precious resources on um, medical masks. You can maybe make your own if you want to walk around, but really outside, as long as you're getting a couple of metres distance, I myself don't wear masks in that situation. I pick the right time to go to the supermarket or the outdoor market here and um, pick my time and I spend no more than five minutes. That's it. And I'd rather do that three times a week than spend half an hour in the supermarket, believe you me. And I just don't think that they're being that careful, quite frankly, in the supermarket. Uh, so there's opportunities for transmission if people start lingering. Um, so <clears throat> droplet is really within a metre or two or even up to three. Um, droplet nuclei a bit further out. True airborne is where the particle is tiny, dries off and starts to move around the room on the currents. So the sort of disease that's spread via airborne spread is measles. That would be my classic case. Whereas influenza, COVID-19, um, whooping cough uh, are droplet spread, close up. And that's the way to remember it. And I think you can actually see that because people have been pretty good keeping that 1.5 metres, we've been able to drive down uh, the cases. So if you're in any doubt, if you kind of think we've overreacted, just look at a couple of other countries around the world, English speaking, and just see how badly they're doing, have been doing, and I'm telling you that because we brought in our restrictions when we did, we've saved a lot of lives, absolutely. And people have been fantastic, I reckon. About one in 10, a bit sort of, you know, wacky, don't believe it, oh, it's ridiculous, who cares? Well, the rest of us do care. Um, but, you know, if somebody says to you, do you think we're overreacting? You've got to say, well, let's look at England and the US. And even I thought we were too late. I thought we were at least two weeks too late. I thought we should have done something by about the 5th, 6th of March, and I was really tearing my hair out. Um, however, we sort of snuck in a bit. We could have reduced the deaths even more. But having said that, I'm pretty proud of that the community has rallied. But of course, now the problem is complacency. And people are saying, oh, you know, we want our tea room back and, um, you know, there's no, there's hardly any cases. Surely we can all visit each other and sit together. Well, yeah, you can visit, but keep the 1.5 metres. So don't sit on everybody's knee, okay? And um, stuff like that. And again, where you can be outside and have a barbie, do it. Um, where you can meet somebody for coffee, walk around the park, have coffee outside. Just outside as much as you like. And I mean, it's winter, what can I say? Um, and of course, the hand hygiene. I know you're all going through plenty of alcohol, but I will show, um, not the drinking type, or maybe some are. I think there's been an uptick in, in that, but I'll show you a few tricks with the alcohol-based hand rub. Um, now, the other part of this that um, I mentioned before is people saying, oh, it's just the oldies. You know, the sooner they're gone, the better. Well, you know, thanks for nothing. I'm one of those. Um, but what you really need to bear in mind is who are the people who come to my clinic? And you know what? A lot of those comorbidities, they're not elderly. Not that we can sort of throw the elderly under a bus, but this is what you need to think about. People with um, diabetes, and they are not necessarily old. Um, some of our juvenile diabetes. What about people with cystic fibrosis who are on high dose corticosteroids? And they're gonna have an altered immune response and they're not all in their 80s. None of them are in their 80s actually with cystic fibrosis. Um, people who are on methotrexate for their rheumatoid arthritis, they're not all ancient either because you know that can have an early, uh, early onset. Uh, blood pressure, especially uncontrolled, but it even looks like controlled blood pressure is, um, is more of a risk with um, mortality. Uh, and there are some definites like obesity, age, etc. But when you think about it, a lot of people in our community who come to you um, have had a bone marrow transplant for their um, leukaemia. Again, they're not old. Uh, people with those um, 
lymphoproliferative malignancies, leukemia, lymphoma, et cetera. Those people under treatment, et cetera, can also have a suboptimal immune response. So that's a lot of people. That is a lot of your patients who come to you. They don't need as many bugs to get sick as the rest of us, and they'll have a poorer outcome. I think you know what a poorer outcome means. They can also remain infectious for longer. So these are the people who normally, with COVID-19, normally for 80% of people at least, you'll actually stop excreting the virus. The body will um, start to inactivate it about five or six days into the symptoms. So it's not unusual to swab somebody on day six, not find anything. So the body's been able to jump on it with its um, you know, various um, macrophages and, and cells like that, that can um, you know, blunt it, just inactivate it. But of course, not everybody gets better. So getting better is a sign that your body is jumping onto the actual virus. So no surprise if you swab somebody at day six, day seven, and they're not positive, but they were positive on day one or even the day before symptoms came out. But for some reason you swabbed them because they were part of a cluster and then they got some symptoms. So it's not uh, uncommon for us to have to do more than one swab on somebody and find that one of them is negative. It can just depend where you are in the phase um, of the illness, but anybody who gets any respiratory symptoms um, get tested. And so if you've arrived at work and your colleague has gone through the symptoms and you go, yes, I have got a couple of those. Home, but home via the swabbing station. Get your swabbing done. The secret to lifting restrictions is testing, testing, testing. Anybody who says, oh, we haven't got it in our town, I always say, well, how many tests are you doing? Oh, no, but we haven't got any. Well, you know what? You can't say that. So that's why, you know, a lot of people are saying, oh, aren't they setting up the testing clinics too late? And I go, no, because we've got, you know, 99% of our population vulnerable. We don't have any antibodies, 99% of us. So we're all vulnerable. So that's what's happening when you see more and more testing clinics opening, um, testing stations. But that's the only way we know how this is moving through our community. That's what's telling us now you can meet with more people. Now you can have some more indoors because the numbers when we do that random testing are not high. But don't expect it to disappear. It would be a miracle if we did eradicate it. But at present, we're talking about suppression strategy throughout the country. So we're suppressing it. Um, mitigating, if you like, but we use a suppression strategy. So the body's defence mechanisms look basic things like being able to cough is important. I think you can see somebody who's got pneumonia and can't even cough, they're in trouble from the start. So if you're examining somebody, you know, they've come in, they've got their mask on because they're symptomatic and you have a listen and they've got pneumonia, I think next stop hospital, let them do the sputum specimens and the work up there. Um, some of you, and in fact, I think a lot of clinics are no longer doing the actual testing or they've got a separate testing station nearby. And so a lot of the patients, in fact, uh, will go there. So that means there's less PPE then that you guys have to, um, have to work. So get stuck into symptoms, I shouldn't be there. I'm only a risk to everybody else and my work will be rubbish. Now, that's also about a culture we've had in healthcare of presenteeism. I'm here, but I'm crook. Well, you're no good to anybody, and in fact, you're a risk and a danger to society. Go home. So I think this is one of the good things that's going to happen to us in healthcare. We're going to stop doing that. Um, you know, we've had a case of a doctor working at three clinics. He was asymptomatic, by the way, but he was part of a cluster and was tested and found to be positive. I don't know how asymptomatic he was because I see that the authorities are even saying mild symptoms slash asymptomatic. That tells me that people aren't really thinking hard uh, about, that they think they've got to feel really sick. But the first day you get that scratchy throat, that's day one. Not, oh, I think I might wait to see if it gets worse. Oh yeah, it's worse, it's worse tomorrow. So I'll go to the doctor and, to, and you know, tomorrow is the first day you feel sick, but yesterday, you know, today was in fact the first day you got the symptoms. And the reason we want to know what day one is, is that we want to know who you've been with the last two or three days. But if you don't turn up till day four, they've now got to go through six days 
of who you've been through, been with, sorry, and uh, start quarantining people. So it's really critical to get into that new swing of saying, I know how this is spread. I know that it doesn't survive for a long time. It, I think paper a few hours and plastic, it might be a day or so, but probably not in great enough numbers to be that transmissible, even after a few hours. Um, hands, absolutely. We're touching out, you've probably counted how many times I've touched my mouth. So mouth and nose, we touch our mouth and nose six to eight times an hour. So when people say to me, oh, I don't touch my mouth, I, you don't even know you're doing it. So that's why, you know, when you see that alcohol hand rub, go for it. I know the authorities say avoid touching the mouth. Well, you know, I think that's almost impossible. Um, I wouldn't be wearing gloves everywhere around the place. People just sort of contaminate everything with them. Much better to do your hands, okay. Um, so uh, the body's defence mechanisms, there is an antibody response with this infection, but there are two issues. And remember, it's, we've only known about this thing for five months when you think about it. Um, with the antibodies, there's always a question when you find an antibody response, have I in fact got the have I in fact found the protective antibodies? Not all antibodies are in fact the protective ones, but it appears that the neutralizing antibodies that they've detected here are protective. But the second question is, how long? How long does immunity last? And I'll tell you what, I hope it's a whole lot better than norovirus immunity, which is very short lived, you know, and you can get another bout sort of a year later or something. So um, that's, you know, I just don't know how long the neutralising antibodies, whether they'll protect you forever or whether they'll only protect you for a year or so. And of course, the thing that everybody's waiting for is the vaccine. And I'm in sort of two minds as to how we're going to go here. But a lot of you would remember SARS. Now, SARS had a much higher mortality rate, much nastier virus, not as transmissible, but much nastier, about a 10% mortality rate. Thank God this isn't that. Um, but with SARS, they've been trying to work on a vaccine for 16, 17 years. So this is a, a tricky virus because some of the vaccines actually induce quite a serious illness. Um, in other words, the reaction of the body is the problem. And I think you've all heard about the people who don't get better or don't begin to improve on day six, day seven, and just sort of keep getting worse. So the second week is your problem. And so what can happen is you can get what we call a cytokine storm, where the T, some of the T cells, et cetera, just begin to cause this incredible inflammatory reaction in the alveoli, in the lungs. They begin to fill up with fluid, can't breathe. Um, and you know, in ICU, look, I think 25% of people in ICU will have organ failure of some sort. So imagine trying to do dialysis on somebody in ICU They've got to lie flat, okay, in the prone position. Just imagine trying to do dialysis on somebody like that. And with, di and with going into ICU, you've got a 50-50 chance of getting out of there alive. So um, thankfully, we've avoided, to this point, I'm not going to say forever, but we've avoided massive numbers at our hospitals. And I know they've all been saying, well, you know, we were waiting and they didn't come in large numbers. Some of us are really glad. Um, and the last thing we need is to see the ambulances rolling up at all the hospitals on standby, I can't see them. Not only that, people with their strokes and heart attacks, um, glucose, you know, ketosis, et cetera, can't be seen because everything's chockers. We've avoided that at present. So keep your distance, stay inside with any symptoms. And when your patients call to book an appointment, you'll be doing a mixture of telehealth, fantastic not always satisfactory for every case, I know that. Then the doctor might say, I want you to come in, wait in the car park, I'll come out and see you. Fantastic, as much as possible to be done outside. The doctor might then say to the patient, look, I do need you to come in because I've got to do a more thorough, you know, I've got to do an examination. But at least that might just take a few minutes rather than have the patient sitting in the doctor's room face to face for 20, 25 minutes, at least the patient is now just in there for a shorter time. So I know the doctors are very keen to avoid that 15 minutes face to face because that increases the risk. So we use that 1.5 metres distance in case any of us or our patients 
uh, in the, incub the late incubation period of the illness because you are infectious that one or two days before the first symptom starts. The only good news I can give you about that is you're not coughing. And if you say to me, but what if I'm coughing? I go, well, then you're symptomatic. <laughs> and it would be the 48 hours before. So even though you're infectious, you may not be as able to transmit it because you're not coughing, sneezing, et cetera, et cetera. You feel perfectly fine. But by keeping your distance, you've actually protected other people. So I do want you to sort of turn it around and say, what if I'm the one? Although I've turned up to work well, am I sitting next to people? Well, I shouldn't be. I should be 1.5 metres apart. Am I hopping into the tea room with everybody? Well, you shouldn't be. You can only have, you know, so many people, but just have a tea room outside, but still observe your distance. Still do your hand hygiene. So we're going to have to keep up the measures, those four main measures, apart from coughing into your sleeve, all that sort of stuff. So yeah, people I think are getting the measures mixed up with the relaxation of the restrictions. They're two completely different things. So hopefully that's going to be sorted out at a state uh, level or, or a federal level. But I know they're getting a bit slack around here. I can see them. And they're, okay, people forget. We know that. Okay, so the body's defence mechanisms, when you've already got comorbidities, your immune response is not optimal. Okay, and that then allows the virus to just sort of keep growing. And I said, even there, you might get a, a huge body immune response, but that's actually the problem. That's, what's, that's what can kill you, that cytokine storm. So, and that's been the trouble with them trying to develop a vaccine for SARS, is that in fact the vaccine uh, has been pretty not tolerated at all and has caused its own problems. Hopefully 16 years further down the track with the research we're doing now, that a vaccine, you know that they're developing about I think 70 or 80 vaccines at present that they're registering and they're just waiting to see which is the one or two that actually work. So that's quite clever that they've actually enrolled or worked up a whole lot of query vaccines for safety. And then the one that actually works, we've already registered it. So um, uh, that means we don't have to wait that six months to actually get it approved. And it's a worldwide collaborative study. You're probably aware of that. Uh, I think there are 70 or 80 centres. We'll have them in, in um, Australia too, Oxford, um, I think, and, and the number all around the world. They're all working collaboratively um, to see which of those is actually going to work. And it's possible that there may be more than one. Uh, what you can't develop is a long-term vaccine because you don't know that it's long-term until time has gone by. So it could be that we may, may end up with a short-term vaccine first off. It may be that we end up with a long-term vaccine. You know how we'll know when cases start to come back, then we'll know that it was a short-term vaccine. Um, all right, now, and obviously, you know, having your flu shot is critical. The last thing lungs need this year after having recovered from COVID-19 is influenza. And if any of you know anybody who've had COVID-19, I know three people, you should hear the cough. Uh, it's a real rib cracker. So, um, you know, people say, oh, you know, 80% of people mild illness. Well, I've spoken to two people who've had a so-called mild illness and they thought, my God, if that's mild, we really, you know, don't know what's going to happen if, if if we had got it seriously. So the health department will say you can expect to have the cough for you know three to six months. So imagine you've told you've been told that you've recovered, you've gone back to work, and all your workmates have got to hear that cough. Bit tricky, okay? And they'll all probably think that you're infectious, but you're not, okay? Um, I think it's healthcare workers who have got to have a clear uh, clearance of a negative swab, or I don't even know whether it's two. But um, generally, the public know if you you've been diagnosed and you've gotten better then you can leave your house. I think it's, it's the 14 days of isolation. But you've got to have gotten better. If you haven't got better, no. Okay, you need to be seen again. Um, what was I going to say? So apart from uh, influenza immunisation, please, those of you who are around little kids, etc., little ones, make sure that your um, whooping cough is up to date. And the older ones amongst us, make sure your Pneumovax has been done. So these are all the basic things that you can tick, 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 
and um, and say that are all done. And obviously, working with body fluids, etc., make sure your Hep B um, is in um, is in line as well. Now, with um, hand hygiene, I wanted to give you some tips. Okay, so you've got to tell me, or you've got to think about what things is Marg showing me that I didn't know. All right, because I'm always thinking. How can I make hand hygiene interesting for people? Are they just going to, you know, zone out? So this is what I'm, I'm thinking. I'm going to tell you a few things. See which ones are new. You can report to me. So the first thing is, do my hands look clean? I'm going to. I haven't worn jewellery for months, and I've just started to put my wedding ring on this week. Maybe I'm a year too early. I don't know. This is what we know. The more jewellery and rubbish you put on your hands, the more you'll compromise hand hygiene. Much easier to go to work like that. Not only that, it's going to take me time to work the alcohol in around the ring. I'm not asking for people to get their wedding rings cut off, but mounted jewellery is a slight disaster with the alcohol and with soap washing because the dirt just hides the bugs in the mounts, you know, in the mounts of the rings. Plain band, I wouldn't go getting it cut off, but I wouldn't even wear one, quite frankly. So can my hands be cleaned? And of course, if you get old skin like mine, it's almost impossible for me to pass that glow bug test. So, you know, you wouldn't put somebody like me in your clinic. So just employ, you know, the 12 year olds, people with really good skin that's easy to clean or 20 year olds. Um, maybe put them all in the front line, the 12 year olds, because that is our healthiest age immunologically. So they should all be working in ICU, the 12 year olds, because they won't get it, uh, yeah, they won't get it that bad. I'm making a joke, but I'm also saying to you that is our healthiest age immunologically. Put them all in there. Um, smooth skin, do you use hand cream? Hand Hygiene Australia say, you're not doing the whole hand hygiene thing if you're not using a compatible, I shouldn't be showing you brands, compatible hand cream two to four times a day. I'll show you how to use that in a second. You do have a choice of the alcohol or the hand rub, but, but I, sorry, the alcohol or the soap, but I can tell you in the clinical setting, we just use alcohol all the time because it's right next to us. So make sure the alcohol is right next to you. It's a 70%. 70% alcohol and it can be gel, it can be liquid. I don't like the foams, but you can actually use the foams. The foams I think are problematic. So 70% alcohol. If you're using a gel, it's definitely got to be 70%. If it's a liquid, you can go down to 60%, but we need you to have a 60% minimum. What we know about the gel is it actually inactivates about 10% of the alcohol. So if you've got a 60% gel, you've effectively only got about a 54% alcohol. So that's why we say 70%, so we can always get 60% alcohol onto your hands. So you go, yep, my hands are, uh, you know, I'm able to get the alcohol all over my hands, nails short and skin smooth. Now, if you have got really long nails, I don't even want to talk about fake nails because the dirt in the joint, the glue, will just trap dirt and the alcohol just won't work. So with your nails, have them short so they shouldn't be above the top of the, top of the fingers. I clipped mine especially for tonight because uh, they were getting a little bit longer. But with long nails, at the distal edge out here, if they're this long, the outer bit underneath, everybody else's bugs. All right, your bugs are sitting just where the um, nail splits from the skin. Okay, so you work out what you'd like behind your nails. I don't want everybody else's bugs there. Now, to use the alcohol, I'm going to try and position this. Okay, so this is what we don't do. We don't do that. So it's always two hands. If you do that, you'll never get enough on. And if you do get enough on, it'll just leak everywhere. So it's always two hands. You can use your elbow, you can use the back of your wrist. Okay, so how much? I'm almost not going to tell you. But this is a little swimming pool, little pond. I put my fingernails in and get it behind my fingernails like that. There are different ways of doing this, but you've got to get it behind your finger. Uh, some people do it like that. So I've got it in. I've now rubbed the alcohol. I've got it so that my hands are all wet. What's the next stage? 
I've got to rub it in. So none of this, no. So you have to rub it in, all parts. And I like to do that. Finger fingertips are what you're touching everything with. So get the alcohol on them. Keep going. And then you'll feel it go a little bit sticky. Okay, but you see that I haven't gone like that and I haven't waited. Now it's sticky and that should be about 20 seconds from the time I put it on till the time it starts to go sticky, about 20 seconds. You can get your gloves on at about 25 seconds. So that's how you know that you've got the right volume on there. So half a mil, useless. And that's what a lot of people use. They just go, fantastic. I can tell you that if it's all dry in three seconds, you've not killed anything. You need those 20 wet seconds. And same with influenza. So you can all email Brianna or get on and say, what did I learn? Now, hopefully you, see, hopefully you write nothing because you know it all and you're perfect. That's wonderful, okay? <laughs> I know what you're gonna say. You're gonna say, oh my God, I'm that person who goes like that. Well, not tomorrow you won't be. You'll be fantastic and you'll be able to laugh at everybody else because they're doing it the wrong way. Um, with the hand rub, two to four times a day. So this is a, um, a barrier cream, right? Don't get anything really expensive from home. It's a barrier cream and you need a decent amount. Decent amount. Best time to use this is when you start your work because you're gonna be doing a lot of alcoholing and washing you know, after that for the rest of the day. So yep, the, um, and yuck. So these things need to be wiped over every day, your high touch surfaces, your pumps, because they start to get stuff build up on them and they don't look very attractive. So it wouldn't look very attractive to have a big clump of yuckies sitting there. Um, with the putting on the hand cream, I'm now ready to start work. So I go up to do my first task. You've got to wait a couple of minutes for this to go soft. In the, you might have been looking through notes or checking a few things, etc. Now you're ready to go off and do your wound care uh, or whatever it is that you're doing. And yes, you'll be putting the alcohol on to start the procedure, okay? But you've, in the meantime, your skin has absorbed the um, hand cream and you've got a bit of a barrier happening. So that'll reduce the loss of oil and moisture. Now, if you're very, at a very um, lucky clinic and you get a morning tea break, you know, I'm just joking, um, go to the toilet, do your hand cream again. You've washed your hands, etc. Do your hand cream again before you go outside for your coffee or, or whatever. So load up early. If you're only doing it twice a day, I would be doing it twice, you know, in the morning because that's when I'm really, really doing loads of hand, uh, hand cream. So hopefully that's helped there. Now I wanted to mention, because your skin is really worth looking after, uh, I wanted to mention a couple of um, uh, tips for doing your soap wash. Um, and here they are. And again, you can email me and see if there was something that you, um, or, or let Brianna know, was there something that I'm saying here about washing that is useful to you? Because I tell you, if your hands start to pack up, first thing you stop doing is hand hygiene because it hurts and you look for opportunities to avoid it and that's not a good situation to be in. So looking after your skin is really important and I think there'll be a lot of skin damage uh, with this pandemic and people won't be using hand cream or the correct hand cream. So it needs to be a barrier cream. Um, just have it the same brand as your, as your alcohol if you can. Certainly the top brands, um, Microshield and Avogad, you know, they, they all have compatible hand creams with them. So if we look at washing, and you must always wash, start and finish of the day is a wash, not a, not a hand rub. Um, toilet, food, they're all washing moments um, because the alcohol is not that effective against the leading cause of, of gastro, but it's good for your respiratory viruses. So when you're going to wash your hands, these are the six tips. I can give you six tips. Number one, am I using the right brand? Well, what is the right brand of hand soap? It's the same brand as your alcohol, which is the same brand as your hand cream. So get that compatible. If you start using um, brands that are not compatible, you just start to get war on your hands. So same brand, 
throughout. Same product range, I should say, rather than same brand, same product range. Stay with that, otherwise issues of incompatibility, not good. So that's number one tip, am I using the right product? Number two, am I wetting my hands first before I go to the soap? If you have dry hands, you know, dry, I don't mean dry hands, you haven't wet them, and you go to the pump, you're effectively putting a harsh detergent onto dry skin. Good luck. Okay, so that's not good. Always wet your hands first, go to the pump. Sing happy birthday to yourself, whatever. 12 seconds is enough, honestly. And it's the same technique of mechanical action that I did for the alcohol. It's actually the same. So 12 seconds this time. Then get it off. That's my tip three. Get it all off. One of the reasons why your skin feels so awful after soap is you just haven't got it all off. And you know what it's like to walk around. Your skin feels stretched and, and tight. Um, you need another 12 seconds. It takes really 12 seconds to get all that soap off. So there's another half a verse of happy birthday. Uh, tip four, never use hot water on your skin. Hot water damages your skin. If you speak to the dermatologists, they'll just say use cold water. And so confessions of somebody who loves hot water, I now just use cold water. Cold water. I think it takes a little bit longer to get it off. You can use warm, of course, but you know, if you've got to wait all day for the tap to go warm, you might as well just use cold. Um, the next tip I can give you, and I've just got to check what I've got here. Okay, a couple of bits of paper towel. Pat, dry, not, not wipe. That would just damage your skin even further. So pat quite firmly like that, okay? Um, you cannot put your gloves on if your hands are half wet. Same with the alcohol. Please wait till the alcohol is completely dry with rubbing before you put gloves on. The alcohol will just create little holes in your gloves. And if you try and put wet hands into gloves from washing, uh, it's highly contaminating, really. So, and tip six is, am I using a compatible hand cream? two to four times a day. So there you go, there are the, the um, six tips. Now thinking about this, when the patients, you know, you're going back to the sort of reception thing, uh, pay a bit of telehealth, a bit of outside in the car, that might be enough for maybe 80, 90% of your patients, I don't know. Some have got to come in. And so you might have three chairs or something in the waiting room, or you might not be using your waiting room and guiding people in, calling them and saying, come in now, the doctor will see you now for that examination. So the patients aren't even really spending any time. At reception, people have got maybe a bit of a sneeze shield as well as a table. So you're definitely getting 1.5 metres. So some people have said to me, oh, now that we've got a sneeze shield, we don't need the patients to be 1.5 metres. And I go, yes, you do. So you see how these are all risk reduction measures? Don't sort of, it's a bit like saying, oh, I've got a mask on, I can go up and hug people. Well, no, the mask will reduce the risk, but so will, you want an additive. All of these things add up. You know, if I see people just doing hand hygiene, but, but running around with um, symptoms, no, they haven't got it. <laughs> or um, keeping their distance and they're out with symptoms, no. So it's cumulative, you know, it's additive. Um, all those measures. If the patient's got to come in and they're symptomatic and you just haven't got enough masks, hand them a couple of tissues. They just hold them like that, do their hands when they've, you know, taken that off for the doctor. So not every patient needs to have a mask on. But I would automatically say to a patient who comes in, um, can you do your hands? You know, we've got our hand hygiene on the little table your hands and can you grab a couple of tissues and just have them in case you cough or sneeze. I would definitely be doing that. Okay, so hopefully that's made life um, a little bit easier um, for you. Now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to stop for a couple of just two minutes and I've got to arrange the vomit spill for you. So let's just have two minutes break and I'm, I'll be in a different place and I'll set that up. I'm also going to show you how to put on and take off the PPE, um, a bit on cleaning and the vomit spill 
and a little bit on antibiotics if you can be bothered. I think everybody's just forgotten about antibiotic abuse <laughs> because they're uh, onto this. So just give me two minutes. Okay, I'll just be buzzing around. Back in two minutes. Is that okay, Brianna? Yeah, that's all good, um, Mark. And maybe when you get back, we can um, answer a few questions that we've got backed up here from um, our lovely participants. Would you prefer that we do the questions? Yeah, would that be okay? Hot, yeah, while we're hot to trot, before we lose our, our thread. Yeah. All right, I'll pass okay, over to Sarah. Sarah will okay, read so out our questions for us. Great. So just a few questions, Mark. Um, would you recommend the surgery's air conditioning to be on or off? Well, it's June and I actually like the doors to be open. So remember, we want lots of air changes, windows open, doors open. And, and let's face it, you guys don't get as cold as us. And we've had a fantastic winter so far. So doors have been open. Um, just look at your, how can I do it? This morning is nice, I've got everything open. This afternoon is rubbish, I'm gonna have to close the door. So you have to close the door. Um, can I get away without any heating or cooling? Can I? Um, I'm just saying this is how you can reduce risk. There is in fact a case history from America of an office and uh, you know, so many people got sick, they were on the airflow. You know, they were, the person who had it was under the air con, you know, that got carry the air around and a number of other people got sick. Now I'm not suggesting that's definitely going to happen, but just knowing how can I adjust the levers to reduce risk in my workplace, that opening that window is like gold. Um, seeing your patients in the car outside is like gold. So it's all the things that you do to reduce risk, but yes, eventually, you've got to close the windows. And you know that that is going to increase risk, but what are all the other things I can still keep doing? So don't give up and say, oh, well, that's it, I had to close the windows. Keep them all going. And I mean, it's just a case of thinking. I don't think we need to miss a beat with our patients. It's just the way we do it. And I know some of you are having to call your patients up to remind them to come in and they're all terrified. Well, they were terrified about coming in. Now they don't care because they think it's all gone. I think it was all a bit of a joke until you sort of get stuck into them or maybe you've had some experiences with really sick people. Okay. Thanks, Mike. And next one, how often would you recommend the carpets to be cleaned within the healthcare centres, even if there hasn't been any cases at the centre? All right, I couldn't be bothered getting a steam clean in of the carpet if, the, if I've had a case. This would be the least of my worries. Nobody is getting sick from licking the carpet, okay? What people do miss is wiping over of high touch surfaces. So this is what you guys would be doing twice a day anyway, the buttons, the knobs, the handles, the whatever, you know, the bits and pieces that we all share. I think people can clean their own computer and phone for heaven's sakes, but and desk, but it's the shared surfaces, us with each other, the patients. That's why I'm not a keen user of the tea room. It's full of saliva and high touch surfaces. I'm not interested. I'll just bring a thermos, thanks. I have my own green tea bags and have my lunch in my, you know, chaff bag in the car, go out at lunchtime, turn my music up loud in my car and forget about the world for 20 minutes. That's what I'd be doing. So no, I'm 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 really upset when I see people thinking that the outbreak is all about out there in the um, car park or out there in the uh, um, waiting room, but we're all okay and cosy having a meeting with 10 of us in the tea room. I mean, that's just crazy. Sorry. We haven't eliminated it. So I'm oh, sorry, I probably didn't even answer the question then. What was it? <laughs> <laughs> was, do you recommend them to um, clean the carpets even though there was no cases? But I think you did answer it. So no, I can't, can't get excited. Can I, remember, it's going to be gone within a day or two anyway. Not that you have to. And I mean, if you have a case, or a cluster, they will do a deep clean. You know, you can call up Mr. Deep Clean and they'll come in and probably steam it for you. But um, that's that's not where the action should be. The action should be in tracing, where did this come from? What things have we been doing that have allowed it to spread? Believe you me, it hasn't spread via the carpet. The carpet is often just done, if at all, it's just done to sort of say the enhanced or the terminal clean has been done. But I can tell you where it gets around. It gets around because people don't keep distance. 
because people don't do their own dishes. They leave their dishes in the sink with saliva for others to do and they don't care because they say it's the patients who are crook, not us. Well, you know, 188 of our 1,700 cases are in healthcare workers in Victoria and you won't be any different. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. And how long can a surgical mask be worn? Do you recommend GPs and patients to wear a face mask during consultation? Okay, well now I'm going to bring you my favourite, favourite thing. That's my face shield. If I were working in a clinic and I have to see patients close up and they are asymptomatic, I would have a face shield on every time. And I wipe it with my, you know, my detergent wipe. So I'm protecting them from me. And I've got a bit of a sneeze shield, if you like. Call it a sneeze shield. Now, if the patient mentions a symptom, remember they've already had to get through the through my receptionists who are really being tough and saying to people who are symptomatic back out to the car. But let's say the patient has got through, they've said that they're asymptomatic and now they're sitting in front of me, their GP, and they're beginning to talk about breathlessness and they didn't want to tell the receptionist because they might get turned away because patients are telling a few fibs at present. I think you've worked that out. I am reaching for my surgical mask like that, very quickly. And in fact, I'm reaching for two masks because the patient's gonna get one on. And that's the way I would conduct the rest of the um, examination. Now, if I'm gonna have to do, and obviously gloves and bits and pieces. So I would, I would really say to you, um, sorry, what was the first part of that question? Because I was gonna go on to another part. With the mask, oh, that's right. How long the mask? Yeah, how long the mask could last? Theoretically, two, three hours, but only in your dreams. This is what happens with the mask. This is what happens. You've all seen it. Sorry, I've actually got to get it on. I shouldn't look at this when I do that. Right. You all see it. For some reason, we've got a mask on, we're gonna to touch it. I'd rather that, unless you have to have a mask on, I'd rather you didn't. Quite frankly, I think the face shields are fantastic, um, but it's entirely up to you. Myself, because I know that I end up touching it and you're supposed to do your hands. As soon as you touch a mask, you're supposed to do your hands. To take it off correctly, it's a way. Now, I'll show you correct use of masks after the, after the break. Um, now, they've got to a, a very sad point in parts of America. We know that the virus doesn't survive very long on paper. So when they've run really short of PPE in America, in parts of America, they've actually issued each staff member, just think about this, five masks and five paper bags. And the staff member wears one, for the whole morning, which means no breaks, no toilet, no nothing probably, puts it into a paper bag and takes out the next one for the afternoon so that by the time two days later they need a new mask, they use the one from day one morning. Now, I just hope that we don't get to that stage. I don't want you washing masks. I don't want you making them to wear to work. The ones that you make, you can wear wherever you like, but um, and you still got to keep your distance up anyway. So. With the masks, you can definitely see more than one patient with a mask on, but not, if you touch it, you're gonna to have to do your hands. And you can't put alcohol on gloves. So that means taking off my gloves, doing my hands, putting on a fresh pair of gloves. Now, you would wear a fresh pair of gloves for each patient. You know, if, if you're doing a COVID clinic, I'm talking more about. So you can wear the same mask, the same face shield and even the same gown, going patient to patient, you would change your gloves in between, okay? So that's not called being miserly, that's just called extending the use of that. But for me, I think after half an hour I've had enough. I just wanna get that stupid thing off my face. And so I say to some of the doctors who are doing the clinics, look, 
putting on and taking off PPE is very wearing and you're also likely to make mistakes and start contaminating yourself. I wouldn't make people wear PPE for any more than two hours, um, but I think that they would need a mask change after about half an hour. I, I just think it's really wearing. Um, so the surgical mask get, I think a couple of hours uh, is what they say it can be worn. But um, hopefully we don't get to that stage where it's got to be. If it gets wet, it's got to come off straight away. Sure. Yep. Um, so do you recommend Glen 20 spray to be used on surfaces and how do you recommend appropriately cleaning keyboards? A lot of the formulas take the letters off. What do you think would be the best? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, it looks like we're talking about cleaning, doesn't it? So what we know is um, just do an ordinary detergent and paper towel or a detergent wipe, clean, you know, wipe of your high touch surfaces a couple of times a day. So maybe at midday, maybe at five o'clock and the cleaner can come in and do a proper clean, you know, whatever. But paper towel and detergent, we don't tend to use sprays in healthcare anymore. So it's, um, oh, where did I put it? A flip lid bottle. Some of you who saw me do the instruments today, so just a flip lid onto paper towel. If you're filthy rich, if you're a really rich clinic, you can use, um, you know, your detergent wipes. You know, do a whole lot of handles. You, you know, you can make one wipe last more than one handle. Uh, and what you're doing is you're just removing the soil that's got the virus in it. If you want to go in and do um, disinfection, you've got probably two main products. Now, Glen 20 does have the right product in, but I don't think it's delivered the right way and it possibly doesn't have the right concentration. So let me talk about this particular product. It's in Viroclean, it's in Pinoclean, and it's in Glen 20, and it's called Benzalconium Chloride. Benzalconium Chloride. When you see that, that um, the name of that chemical, it's also in a lot of your um, detergent disinfectants, you know, the bulk ones that they use in hospitals. Benzalconium chloride, you want 0.4%. So there you go, you can scurry off. I wouldn't use Glen 20 as my way of delivering that, no thanks. Plus I don't want any sprays. Sprays aren't good, people are inhaling it. And same with for cleaners, they should not be using sprays because they're inhaling all the time. And if they're spraying a contaminated surface, they can actually be splashed back. That's, they're just not using it. Um, so have a look at your, Vi I think your Viroclean is already at the right concentration. I don't know whether the Pinoclean is, but this is a very easy virus to inactivate, not difficult. So you would clean first with your detergent. And then if you want to disinfect, now you go over those same surfaces and you've got to leave the disinfectant wet for at least a minute. So you can't kind of do a clean and a disinfect and leave it dry in five seconds. You've done two things that aren't right. You've got to clean first to remove the soil. Disinfectant won't work if there's organic matter present. Always got to clean first, okay? Then you can go with the disinfectant. Or you can use, there are two-in-one wipes. Um, I think I've got, I've got mine there somewhere, but you can really only use those on a surface that already looks very clean. And that will actually detergent, it's a detergent. The benzalkonium chloride is actually a detergent, but it's also a disinfectant. If you've got a dirty surface, wipe first to remove the dirt and then repeat and leave wet and that's your disinfection. So Viroclean, lots of people have got that. And again, I shouldn't be promoting brands, but there you go. I haven't checked what the concentration of the um, Pinoclean is regarding the 0.4%. Um, benzalkonium chloride. The other product that people use is bleach. So it might be Domestos, it might be White King, whatever. But um, have a look at the concentration of um, um, sodium hypochloride on that. And it's usually somewhere between four and 6%. Now what you want is 0.1%. So you might have to, if it's 5%, you've got to now dilute at one in 50 to get 0.1%. So 0.1% hypochlorite releases 1,000 parts per million of available chlorine. That's what you want. So don't use it straight. <laughs> so make it up. So you start with your water, you know, in your squirt bottle, and then you add a measured amount of the bleach. You never add water to the bleach. You add bleach 
to the water. Otherwise you get a like that, okay? A bit of a reaction. Uh, and the bleach also goes off. It loses its um, chlorine. So you have to make it up fresh every day. And that's the other reason why we don't use sprays. Imagine spraying bleach. I hope, you, I hope you're not spraying bleach. So something like, you know, the sauce bottle, the perm bottle, the clip lid, etc. perfect. So I went down to Bunnings. I couldn't find any. They got all sprays. So you'd have to go to a cleaning supply and just get a 500 mil, a couple of 500 mil things. They're probably $2 each uh, cleaning supplies. But um, I haven't managed to... Um, uh, to get down there. They might be at the $2 shop, something like that. Uh, so with the bleach, yep, I've cleaned everything with my detergent, etc. detergent paper towel. Now I go over the bleach and I've got to leave it wet. Bit of a problem with, with bleach. If that wetness drips onto your carpet, I think you know what colour your carpet's going to turn. Okay, it's going to go white. However, there you go, that's the bleach and some people love bleach. I don't, okay, I don't. But it's a very easy virus to inactivate. Doesn't it, your bleach doesn't have to be left on for ages and ages. You don't even have to disinfect. It's a choice that you have. But in the case of a positive, yep, we definitely go in and do all that. The other choice you've got is the 70% alcohol. And you go, oh, that's good. I've got lots of that in the little wipes, you know, ISO wipes. However, here's the problem with alcohol. It can damage surfaces. I think somebody mentioned keyboards uh, and it, it can definitely damage rubber and plastics. But also, you've got to also keep that wet for a minute. And if you think about it, trying to wipe over a handle and make sure it's still wet at a minute is impossible with an alcohol wipe. It just all dries within about five seconds. So unless you're happy to stay there, you know, rubbing it for uh, 55, you know, 55 seconds, good luck. So generally, most people use the Viroclean. Okay, enough about that. Thanks, Mike. We might just um, stop for a few minutes and let you set up, and then we could do more yep. questions afterwards. Thank you. Yep. Okay.
There you go, Mark, you're back. I think we can hear okay, you. Yep. Back. Thank you. Okay, so what I thought I'd do is while we're sort of on the main theme, um, I will show you how to put on and take off the full PPE in case you need uh, to do it. So the things that I've got, something to it for my eyes. You can wear a um, face shield if you want, but you'll still need to wear a mask. But when you um, use the uh, goggles, I use goggles rather than safety glasses, but you can wear safety glasses. The virus can enter theoretically through the conjunctiva. And it's not enough to use your own glasses as protective wear. You've got to wear something over them. Um, I've also got a container here that I'm going to put this into when I take it off. I'm going to take that off for a wash, just to wash with soap and water and you can wipe it over with your Viroclean, whatever. Okay, so I've got that. Um, and I've been told that I've got to go into a room to either swab or examine somebody who's a query um, COVID-19 case. I've got my masks. So I'm going to put all this on before I go into the room. Um, so I've got, whoops, just a minute. Back in a second, just dropped something off the trolley. The gown. Okay, so long sleeved. And you might have seen in different hospitals, I think in England, they've been using shorts, um, you know, a disposable gown. Now, whether they've run, sorry, apron, whether they've run out or they're trying to conserve or just keep it for in the ward, I wasn't sure, but I think I noted it in emergency in the UK. And I've got to say the weakest evidence is around the clothing. It really is clothing protection. We haven't got strong evidence from the flu uh, pandemic of 11 years ago. We haven't got strong evidence that people were getting sick from their clothing. In other words, you know, there, we couldn't really see transmission there. So that would be one of the first things you'd ditch. And I notice that, it, it, you know, if you ran short, I notice that for the pathology collection, they don't ask for them to wear gowns um, unless the person is, I don't know, maybe got pneumonia or spitting or something like that. So this is the gown. It's got a, I think you can see it's very see-through. Um, and the gloves. So let's say, and I will also show you how to put a P2 mask on. Now, for somebody with hair like mine, I would probably wear a cap if I'm putting this stuff on and off because it's so much easier for me to get my glasses and mask on if my hair is out of the way. So that's why you'll see a lot of people, say in the hospital situation, wearing a cap. It's because they've either got hair like mine or they've got long hair. And it's not necessarily an infection prevention thing. It's just easier for me to get my um, cap on and off, you know, my um, headgear on and off. So the first thing you do before you put anything on is your hands. So back to two hands, doing your alcohol, et cetera, et cetera. 20 seconds, I think you know how much to put on now. I didn't do mine then, I was just pretending. So first thing I put on is my gown. All right, it may get to the point that we run out of gowns and you've got to use aprons, but right now we're using the gown. So you tie it up and it's always impossible for me to tie it up in a hurry. Um, that's the way life is, I think. Then around, I'll just push that, see a bit better. Okay, so around the waist. Okay, you don't have to do it in a bow. I'm just doing it in a bow to sort of conserve it. And of course, because I'm showing you how to do it so quickly, I can't do it. <laughs> All right. The first thing you put on, I'm actually going to take my glasses off because it'll be easier. So the colour out is the way the mask is worn. There are three layers and so um, it's the green side out. Um, the correct way to wear it is to make a big pouch. It's really got to cover your face. Now you've got to pinch it down. I do see a lot of people who wear it like this. You can see right, that's hopeless. Or what about this? Useless. What about that? Dangerous. <laughs> They're just going to contaminate everything there. So there we go. Cover it. Make sure. So you're actually breathing out the sides. 
That's the way it operates. The next thing to put on, as I mentioned, your goggles. And so they go over the top of the mask. I think you can see that. They, they go over the top of it. The mask is about a halfway down, a third to a halfway down. <clears throat> then your gloves. <laughs> see how when you've got symptoms and you've got a mask on, you're actually protecting other people. <laughs> now I've got a dry cough. Okay, so the gloves actually go over. Can you see that? They go well over. Occasionally I see people on television not wearing this properly. You can imagine I want to phone up and say something. Um, okay, so over, so there should be no bare skin showing. I'm going to go in and do a swab. So I'll take the swab in. It's been pre-labelled even. I know that's a crime. But I don't think I'm going to get in there and start contaminating biros and God knows what. So um, you might have to go in. Now there's usually a bit of a bench in that room where you're going to do your swabbing. There should be some basics there, a spare pair of gloves, a spare mask, not open, but a good couple of metres away from where the patient is sitting. Uh, what else do people have there? Um, uh, where you measure oxygen, oxygen saturation device, stethoscope. So you might have some stuff in a bit of a container on a bench just as you go in the door. There'll be a clinical waste bin. Um, with the uh, swab, or and, and we do a nasopharyngeal, an oropharyngeal first, and then a nasopharyngeal. And again, I've not seen, I've seen sometimes they're not done correctly. If the patient's got to tip their head, and it's got to go in like, like that, not up. <laughs> and it's really got to touch a part of your head that you just didn't know existed. All right, so that's the way you're going to do your two swabs, oropharyngeal and nasopharyngeal. There are some new tests that they're looking at that don't involve that sort of invasion and they say that they're validated, but I'm going to keep out of that, okay? Right now we do the one swab in the two sites, but you've got to get the pharynx. You've got to get the back of the pharynx, absolutely. That's where that virus is growing. That's the target cell. So you might take it, there might be a path bag in there. So have that open a bit before you even go near the patient as you walk in. Um, hand rub, and a hand rub on a little table next to the patient. Have two chairs, patient and somebody's brought the patient, so they've already begun to get infected, you know, the cohort, whatever. I wouldn't sort of start separating families, or, you know, a couple at that point, if they've been sharing space, the ones probably begun to get it. So there they are at their little table. You've come in and you've got everything you need on that back bench. A good, a good more than two metres, a little container that you're going to put this on. Um, usually there's an esky out in the corridor to receive the swabs, okay? So you've got all everything on. You've gone in, used your elbow. You get very good at using your elbow and your foot. For things like this you might not even close the door completely I don't know um, and so the first thing you do is don't ask the patient to take their mask off they've got their mask on examine the patient if the patient does have a pneumonia that's it you're not going to be taking any specimens at all okay a sputum specimen is preferred best done in hospital and you would use different PPE for that sort of thing but you examine the patient and you decide, yes, I'm gonna take a couple of swabs. So you can ask the patient to just take the mask off, maybe just one side and hold it, and you do the two swabs. Ask the patient to put it back on and do their hands. All right, so they've got their own hand rub that you've given them. You then go to your back, to your table, where the end of the swab is, you know, the tube, just put the swab in, you're finished examining the patient and you might have to yell some instructions as to whether you need to get a, um, you know, an ambulance or whether they need anything, all right? Or whether you just give them instructions to call, you know, in two days time, whatever, for the result and some advice on how to manage themselves, treat them as possibly positive, okay? So they go into isolation until they hear more. 
So they buzz off. You might even be able to stop them touching the doorknob, but if they do, we'll, you know, we'll all be doing the ha our hands up. So they buzz off. You don't need to leave the room empty for any length of time. The virus has settled very quickly in those big droplets. Okay, so people go, oh, should I leave the room empty? No, you don't need to. What you're going to do is at the back bench, you take off your first, your gloves. Now, the way to take your gloves off is pinch, right, grab, and then there and over. So you, whoops, great, I dropped it. They go into your yellow bin. Do your hands, okay? Now, you're actually going to go back to where the patient sat and clean. So you put your next pair of gloves on. Don't, don't double glove, that would be not good, okay? Put your next pair of gloves on and grab your wipes. So I'll show you what I've got. I've, um, I've got wipes that, oops. Okay, so I've got my detergent wipes. And maybe I'm going to grab a couple. And I'm going to do um, the armrests that the patient has sat in the chair and they've got armrests. They're a high touch surface. So I go over the armrests, fold that over, do the other armrest. I then, you know, fold that around again and I do the table that the patient has been near. So anything that's within a metre of really where the patient was. And you see why we don't take the patient's mask off until just when we do the swabbing. So that reduces the amount of coughing and et cetera. You might even say to the patients, here's a couple of tissues for when you take your mask off, just in case you need to cough. Okay, so you might need a couple of wipes and you've done those surfaces. You don't need to do the floor, obviously, nobody's gonna get sick from that. Back to the bin. And then you say, oh, I've got my disinfectant wipes. You might have even taken these out. So this is just one brand. Of course, I'm not going to be able to open. This is a new pack. But you take those, one of those out, and now you would go over the surfaces that you've wiped with the disinfectant and just allow it to dry. Okay, that's how you do it. Or you might have your solution of bleach or whatever, you know, two solutions, one of detergent, one of bleach, or you might do wipes, it doesn't matter. So back to the back area where your bins are, gloves off, that's always the first thing that comes off, the gloves, into the bin, hands. Okay, hands are done. What's the next thing that comes off? Eyes, so only touching the back, take the safety glasses off, and they're going to go into the container. They're just gonna go and be washed. Or you might have a face shield that's gonna go into a container and that also is gonna get a wipe. Imagine you're doing this all day, you wouldn't be changing like this. You'd just be changing your gloves and doing the patients one after another. And after 10 of them, you've had enough, okay. Next thing to come off is my gown. So you undo it. Okay, so we never touch the outside front, then down, and it's very slow inside out. This is a, a fluid repellent gown, and I can then just drop it into the bin like that. Then to take this off, the loops and down. Hands. So you can see you do your hands twice when you're actually taking um, taking it off. Now, I was going to show you how to put on the P2N95 mask in case you ever have to use it, but I'd be a bit shocked if you were using this in general practice because there really is no need. So with this, you can see it's also got a nose bridge. And again, I've seen people using these incorrectly, I think, in one of the American things. And of course, they're touching them all the time. Two rubber bands, very different to feel. So what this does is that this stops the smaller bits of spit and snot. 
getting in, that's one thing. But number two, you're breathing through this. Not like the surgical mask where I'm breathing really out the side. Here, I've got to form a good seal and actually breathe through it. Theoretically, you can wear these for hours and hours, but you can't, it's, it's just impossible. So this is the way you put it on. You hold the two strings apart like that, and you get your mouth in, and one band goes on the crown and the other below the ear. So you can see that. Then you come around to the front and about a third of the way down the nose, pinch it. Pinch it. Now come around and is it nice and tight? Do a yawn, pinch it a bit more. Now do some heavy breathing. See how it collapses? I'm breathing through the mask. If I can feel hot air racing out here, guess what's coming back in? It's even a little bit low, there we go. This is called a fit check, not a fit test. A fit test is completely different. A fit check. And this is what you're required to do every time you put one of these on. You cannot wear P2s with facial hair, with a beard or anything, so sorry. There we go. Now to take it off, you grasp the two, the two bands. You see what I mean about hair like mine? And you take your head out. Now I didn't actually take my head out correctly there. I'm just going to do this again because this is a bad habit that I've got. So when you take it off, it's best that you take it away, away from the ear and down. That's, that's preferred so that you're not shaking it. So I didn't actually do it correctly the first time. It's away and down. So I just want, and obviously hands. So if I was doing, say, an aerosol generating procedure, collecting sputum, bronchoscopy, intubation, that's the mask I would wear for that. That's also the mask I would wear for an active TB uh, case. But when they do those particular procedures, they have you know, negative pressure rooms. They're very different. We're just not doing that sort of stuff um, in general practice. So I just wanted to um, show you that. One last thing with cleaning is the technique. So let's say I'm using the wipe and I've got my gloves on, for example, and I've got to wipe my reception bench. So remember, people grab the underside of it or the table. You know, you've got the metre and a half. So what you would do is you use a lot of pressure, really pushing down, and it's an S shape, S, and then you might fold it over or use new paper towel and detergent, and it's a lot of pressure. So the more pressure you apply to that bench, the more dirt you'll pick up, and the more dirt, the more virus that's in it. And then underneath, which is where people are touching. Okay, so pressure is what will uh, result in that cleaning. So think about that. It's not just a little you know, wipe around the table. And of course, we use the S shape because that avoids a lot of redistribution and use a fresh side of the cloth. It just reduces. It's a bit like mopping. I know they use the one bucket, but they are in fact putting less down each time. You know, they'll do a... Um, refresh of the mop etc and then I think they have to change the bucket after every so many square metres you know this is in the hospital when they're uh, doing all that kind of thing. Now the last thing I was going to show you because I don't think we'll we'll do too much on um, uh, is fun all right and you probably if you're going to have your dinner I'm really sorry because this is a little bit gross but I'm going to see how well you can see this. I may have to put another light on, but what I'm going to do here is do a vomit cleanup. So this is the this is the best part of today. Okay, I'll just get my this is my yellow bag. I've got a yellow bag handy, and we'll see how we go. All right. So first of all, I'll show you my 
That's my vomit, so that's wheat bix. So this is your party trick to show them at work. Now hopefully we haven't got any gastro outbreaks, so that'll be good. But here it is, I've just got a half a wheat bix in half a cup of water. So I'll show you that in a secchi. If I have a look at your spill kit, this is what I'm looking for. So I've got a bit of a mess here, but I'm going to show you what I've got in here. So I'd be looking for what things are in my spill kit for me to put on my personal protective wear. So you'd be looking for in your, oh, where is it? I did have two of these aprons, two plastic aprons. It's just easier to have two of everything and that caters for two spills or where one spill needs um, a lot of attention. I can't believe that I've lost my, I'm actually going to thin. Nope, can't see it. Okay, I did have two aprons. What else would I need for PPE? Aha, a couple of pairs of gloves. I've got a bit of a mixture here. There we go, there are my two pairs of gloves. Beautiful. Now I've got to have something for my face. So do you notice we're okay about using aprons for body fluid spills? You can use a gown if you want, but it's okay to use an apron. So I'm rummaging through my spill kit. And I'm looking for something to protect my face. Now I think this is the best thing. So there's your mask bit, there's your eye protection. I think these are fantastic. Otherwise it's a mask and glasses. But now that I've got my new, my new friend, my face shield, just a minute. I could use this and a mask. If you were terribly clever, you could probably protect your face a bit by sitting it there on your chest and might, you might even get away without a mask, but I shouldn't really be telling you bad habits. So there are my PPE, a couple of things for my, for my face, a couple of pairs of gloves and a couple of aprons. That's my PPE. This is the way to have a look at your thing. The next thing I would look for are things that would stop the spill from splashing. So one of the really basic things you can do is to have a couple of vomit bags in your spill kit because sometimes when you're asked to go to the spill, the patient has not been given a bag and they're still being sick. <laughs> so there you go, give the patient a bag. What else can we give the patient? Well, not too much there, but what I have got, oh, I've got another, I did have another one. I did have another apron, so there you go, I've got enough for two spills. What I'd be looking for here would be a whole lot of paper towel because the spill could be urine or blood, you know, like a large amount. So by having a nice big fat wad, I can absorb that. So there are two things so far for absorbing the spill. Now the magic stuff is kitty litter. So I've got about 300 grams of kitty litter in there. It's just clumping, not the crystal stuff, clumping. So if it's a vomit spill, I think this is the best stuff to put on there because it um, deodorizes. I think it's really good. And they're my three things. So if you think in threes, three things to protect the parts of my body, three things to absorb. I'm looking for three things to clean up. Now the rest of this is a bit of a mess, but this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for just a couple of bags. Okay, um, yellow bags preferably, but don't panic. You've got a bag, you're going to bring it to the side, you're going to open it up, and you're going to be able to scoop everything in there. So, some bags, some scoops. Now, look, I've just cut up some old folders, plastic folders, but you've got to make sure they're rigid enough. Or you can use, you know, glove boxes or something like that. So, I might use cardboard, but not really thick cardboard, flexible enough. Otherwise, you end up in a bit of um, bit of strife. Um, and then, lastly, something to clean with. So, when I go through this, here are the things that I've found. Oh, some disinfecting wipes, and hopefully they're still wet, and they're in a snap lock bag. So, I've just put three or four of those in to disinfect. And for actual cleaning, once I've absorbed the spill and I've scooped it and taken it away. You can either have some, I've just used the end of a pack of wipes here, or just some wet ones. You can even use these on your, on your hands, obviously, when you take your gloves off. So uh, what do we do? We'll use the wipe, we'll use these. 
and I've got some disinfectant wipes for later on. I've got my scoops. Now I'm gonna put everything on. So I've been told that there's a spill and I'll create the spill for you in a minute. As I said, it will definitely put you off your dinner. So here's my PPE. I've got my gloves, I've got my face. Oh, I've got something to protect my clothes. I've got my scoops. I've got my kitty litter. And I'll get rid of everything else. This is just a distraction. And I've got my vomit. I think you really do want to see that. So this is the way we're going to do it. I'm just going to check that everything's right. I'm sitting down. Obviously, nobody would sit down and clean up a vomit spill. So I've been told that there's a spill in the waiting room. And I'll pretend it's lino. I know you guys have carpet, but I'll deal with carpet and sticky. So here I am in the back room and I'm going to put everything on. So the first thing I put on is my apron. Now, if you've got staff who don't know about these aprons, um, they'll say, oh, is that the apron? I thought that was just a plastic bag. So this is the apron. You've got to be very careful with it because if you pull them around a bit, they just break. So here's the apron. What I would do is um, fold it up at the back a bit, loop it so that it gives me good, good protection here. Put it on. I'm doing this back to front, trying to look at the camera. Obviously, don't wear too many clothes when you're at work. Wear short sleeves if you can, etc. cetera, but um, that's fine. Then I'm gonna put my face on and you see how easy these are to wear. I think they're a little bit rare, a bit hard to get at present, as you can imagine. See how I make a good pouch out of there? Make sure I can get my face in completely. Gloves. Now you'll have to watch this next part very quickly because I don't know how flat this surface is and whether the vomit is going to run everywhere. It's multi-grain, wheat bix. Okay. <laughs> right. So here's the spill. We're ready to go. There we go. Is that nice? So with my kitty litter, all I'm going to do is go around the edges. That stops it moving. Use it all up, absolutely. Use it all up, that goes into the bin. Now it doesn't take too much long, longer and it will be absorbed. So what you don't want to do is start fishing around with paper towel and trying to clean it all up. It is much better to absorb it like that and then with your nice scoops, just come in, there we go, into the bin. And you've virtually got no wetness there. Okay, hopefully you've not touched too much either. Now to clean up, Just grab a couple. Obviously you can only use this pack once because you'll have contaminated it by touching everything. And to clean it, what we do is you start from the outside of the spill. I know all spills are different, but from the outside and slowly into the inside. So you see the inside is, is the most contaminated part of the spill. There we go, that's done and I think it'll need another one. So use a couple, sometimes you might need more, but this is so much safer than fiddling around with a, a really infectious spill. Now, that looks pretty clean to me. Okay, cleaned it. Now, if you want, they say it's optional, but I would always do it, um, and I wouldn't go, fishing too much, but here are my disinfectant wipes. What I would tend to do, these actually do need a good five wet minutes. So this is not like COVID. Trying to get rid of norovirus is more tricky. I would actually put those, you might have more than two, but 
especially those wet on the spill. They're going to need a good five minutes to get rid of this virus, much harder to get rid of. Leave that. In the meantime, you can, you know, take off your gloves and take off everything. But what I'll do is I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll just pretend that we've, we've done it. And all you would do is just go like that with a new set of gloves on. So for me to take all of this off, what I would do is gloves. I think you know the right way. Don't start touching your skin or pulling them off like a pair of gloves. So always up, grab and over and out okay, into the bin. Then maybe some angel hands you some hand rub or somebody hands you a couple of wipes for your fingers. You'll wash them at the end, but that's not a bad interim step. Then you'd like to take your glasses off, but you can't because they're attached to your mask. So what you're going to do is to do a quick snap down and a snap at the back, bring it around, inside out, roll it up, out, and then same idea with the loops and away into the bin, take the bag out to the, you know, the storage area, whatever, shouldn't have touched my face, wash your hands. That's the best way we deal with the, um, um, with the gastro. So that was what I wanted to show you. That's so clean up. You can imagine if it's just a drop of blood, honestly, I'm not going to go and get a spill kit. Drop of blood, I'm going to put a glove on, get a piece of paper towel, absorb, absorb it, and then come by and clean it with my wipe and then disinfect if it's in a spot where people could actually, um, you know, contract hepatitis B, like a skin surface. The floor I can't get excited about. I mentioned before about um, carpet. You can still scoop the vomit and the kitty litter, but you can't rub. So you might be able to pick up some of the clumps, you know, like have the wipe in your hand and use that to pick up some of the clumps that are still left. But basically you're going to have to cover the lot with some nice smelling, um, you know, uh, paper towel in Pina Clean or some of the wipes that I've used paper towel, a chair, and call the steam cleaner. And it needs to be a high temperature uh, steam cleaner. So I'm just going to check the time because I think that we've reached time. Can you tell me, Brianna, have we reached time? Yeah, we probably have a couple of minutes for some questions if Sarah wants to read out a couple more questions for us. Good, good. Yeah, sure. So... If you could kindly answer this one, Mike, please. Is it worthwhile to do blood tests on patients or people to test for COVID-19 antibodies? Okay, this has been um, a vexed question, but let me give it some context. Imagine you're flat out taking swabs. The resources of the lab have been put into diagnosing cases. And some genius asks you, would you mind also uh, taking some blood? And by the way, would you mind popping some antibody tests through? I think you'd want to kill them. Because what our focus is on at present and our resources are diagnosing cases. You do not produce antibodies on day one when you have your swab done. The antibodies, you'll probably start to detect them at about day nine, day 10. And guess what? You've begun to recover. So the value of the antibody test is not going to be the same as the diagnosis. We want the diagnosis really early. That's where all of our effort is. And we are flat out, the labs are flat out doing the testing. And if we said, would you like to do some antibody tests? It's a little bit academic. Yes. Now, what I think would be fantastic if we could start taking blood from the population and just saying to people, did you ever record any symptoms over the last three months? Well, that's going to be a little bit you know, vague for a lot of people to answer. Um, but there are people who might have recorded in their diary. Yes, I did have something that sounds a bit like this. And I mean, it won't be before uh, the middle of January. Uh, so we take blood and we find some antibodies. Well, what are we going to do about that? Um, we think with some of the antibody tests done so far, 
um, yes, there are people who don't appear to have had an illness. And again, unless you ask people to take a symptom check every day for a year, how are we ever going to know that they were asymptomatic? Because people will often ignore a bit of a dry cough and a little bit of um, a bit of a sore throat. Oh, that was nothing, that couldn't have been COVID. So they won't actually report it. Um, I think that we will do antibody look back studies in the future, but remember, we're not even sure that the antibodies are gonna last or whether they're protective. We're far more interested in knowing that protective antibodies have been produced. We don't even completely know that. It looks like they are, but we don't know how long term it is. So me, as a microbiologist, I would love every swab um, that's positive for the person to come back in a week's time or you know two weeks time and we take some antibodies. We have been doing that with a few people um, but I've got to tell you we just don't have the resources, time, uh, you know money etc and we need to put that into testing every time. Thanks okay, that, Mike. Um, if you're infectious before you start getting the cough symptoms, is that because just from breathing that you will pass the virus onto someone else? And how close and for how long do you need to be with someone for this to happen? Okay, yes, um, they say that you begin to produce a lot of virus about 0.7 days before your first symptom starts. You know, that's the day before. We even might, in some countries, I think they allow 48 hours. I think we allow 24 hours. Um, of course, if you're not symptomatic, you're not gonna be as efficient at, at transmitting it. In other words, you're not coughing. And if you say, well, I am coughing, well then you're symptomatic. And it was the day before when you weren't symptomatic that you were also infectious. Um, so, Yes, you are producing a lot of virus that day before, but you're not probably as efficient at spreading it because you're not coughing. Yes, talking. And uh, I had to laugh. I read something recently. Well, just shut up. Don't talk <laughs> for the next year. <laughs> then you won't, you know, if you're asymptomatic, you won't spread it. Or people like me who are very loud, you know, like, just, just be quiet, please. <laughs> So there you go. There are there are risk reduction strategies like that. Don't suit some of us. Um, thanks for that, Mike. Um, and what do you think about eucalyptus cleaners? Um, do you think they're good and can they be used for cleaning and disinfecting? Um, they're not recognised in the health system. Certainly for deodorising, definitely. But um, in most plant in most plants, there are antimicrobial factors. Tea tree, eucalyptus, lavender, I can tell you, yes. But you would have to know that they're specifically, um, um, you know, effective against this. Can I actually say that we haven't tested those disinfectants like bleach and uh, uh, viroclean and alcohol? against this exact virus, it's too dangerous. We'd have to grow the virus up and test. So what we do is we use a surrogate virus. I can't remember what the name of the surrogate virus is for this one, but we use a virus with similar characteristics, but it's not you know, going to infect people. Imagine asking people to test this exact virus in the lab. You're going to risk people's health. Um, even with all the proper checks and balances in a good lab, there's still a chance that the virus will you know, get out and infect people. So no, we use a surrogate virus. We do that for a lot of our virus. For hep B, we use duck hep B rather than human because we can easily, uh, more easily grow that. Thanks, Mike. And our last question for tonight is, what do you think about schools returning with students not social distancing within schools? Well, that's called life. So look, here are the options. You tell me what, there'd be a riot if you said to people, oh, we're going to eliminate, eradicate the virus from Australia. All you've got to all do is stay inside for six weeks and not go out, not shop, not talk to anybody except the people in your three or four. Now, yes, you could eradicate it. You'd have a riot on your hands. I think we've done really well to suppress it uh, to this level. So with the schools, that was the similar thing. What do we do? Look, we seem to have the numbers right down, and that's the truth. We've got the numbers right down. So why don't we try? It seems that kids don't particularly get it seriously. 
So why don't we try one lever at a time? Let's return kids. I think if you're the same as us, we did kids in different classes. You know, I think the prep to two and then the year 11 and 12. Wait two weeks. Did we get an uptick in cases? No or yes? No, we didn't. Now let's put the rest of the kids. So what they do is they do a um, relax, a restriction, let it go for two weeks because you know that it, it's a median of about six days uh, for you to get the infection, you know, for you to become symptomatic. We allow two to 12, two to, yeah, two to 12 days, but most people it's around uh, the median is six, five, six days. So no, we didn't get an increase. Therefore, we'll let the rest of the kids back. Do we get an increase? No. So that's telling us that we're not getting this huge, you know, this is an experiment if you like, and that's why you do a little bit at a time. Uh, funeral, five people. Seem to not be getting spread, 10 people. Um, let's open the bars, but let's keep it four square metres per person. Are we getting an increase or not? You see, so we do a little bit at a time because you, I, I think the idea of locking everybody down completely is probably not proportionate to the risk of um, serious infection. In other words, if we had something that was a 10% fatality rate, we would have managed this very differently and we would have all been locked up forever and ever and ever, I can tell you, you know, until we absolutely eradicate it, because you can't have something with a 10% fatality rate getting around the community. If you look at Ebola, much worse than 10%, and you saw what happened with the Ebola um, outbreak. That was, that's just, you know, can't do it. So you've got to look at what is the seriousness of disease. So we know that 5% of people end up in real trouble. So what we can't have is saying, oh, well, Look, you know, the sooner we all get it, the better. Well, you know what? You'd have an absolute crisis in your health uh, system because you would have hundreds of thousands of people all trying to get into their ICU beds and I think you know what's going to happen there. So it's manageable at present. We know that we can give people good ICU uh, treatment because we've been able to keep the level uh, really low. That's about all I can advise there. Um, thanks, Mike. Sorry, we had just one last question come through. Would you recommend practice nurses wearing face shields uh, when attending patients for longer than 15 minutes? And also, I think you mentioned before about some of the preventable disease um, vaccines to be administered during pandemic. Do you mind if you touch base on that quickly as well? Which vaccines you recommend? Well, certainly the flu shot, certainly. Um, and Pneumovax, for those of you who are 65 and older, you can, well, obviously you can get Pneumovax before you're 65, but you get it for free at 65. So yeah, just keep an eye on that. If you're around little kids, please make sure that if you haven't had a, um, whooping, a pertussis shot for 10 years, that you should go back and have another one. So they're the things you can put in place to at least say, you know what, the last thing we need on top of this is somebody getting pertussis and stuff like that. They're the three main ones, but in terms of respiratory spread, uh, that you'd be looking at. You're probably also aware of the, um, you know, the ship that uh, has come to pick up all the sheep in Fremantle a couple of weeks ago and the, the guys on board, the, the sailors, there was an outbreak and they picked up a TB in one of them. Okay, so this is, you know, this is really good health care, really good public health care in action and we should really be proud of that. Of course, there's going to be the odd stuff up I mean, just as we do the odd stuff up, like, oh yeah, I should have come a couple of days ago and I probably infected 50 people by now. So, you know, that's the sort of stuff up we do as, as the public. We don't get onto things quickly enough or we've gone off and hugged, you know, 50 kids or something like that. So yeah, we've all got to keep doing our bit. Thank you. So, sorry, Mark, do you recommend practice nurses wearing face shields for oh, attending yeah. patients? I am a big fan of the face shield. I'm a big fan. <laughs> so I'm a receptionist, I'm a big fan of the sneeze shield and the 1.5 metres and nobody's going to work in reception with me. Please don't have your drink bottles at reception. That looks so bad. Drinking, touching your face, it contaminating yourself, not good, all right? Um, so I myself am a big fan of the um, shield. I've looked at three or four different brands. You can pay up to $40, $50. But as long as it's washable, you know, you can clean it. 
uh, and you can hang it up. Try to hang it up like the fire wardens bits and pieces, but wipe it in between uses, wipe it, and then at the end of the day, give it a wash. Absolutely. So I'm a big fan of the face shield, and I actually think you're going to see more and more. Down at the clinic, uh, at my doctor's, they all wear face shields, the doctors. And when we went to get our uh, flu shot a few weeks ago, I noticed the doctor giving me the shot there. She had her face shield on too. So you see how they're kind of like, they're not irritating to wear. Get a really nice clear one. I think mine's mine's a bit too cloudy. That's what I think. But it only cost me $6. But it's not a really good one because there's a gap at the top. But I would wear it um, if I'm going to be face to face with my patients. But as soon as that patient mentions a symptom, I'm going to slip the mask on underneath. Um, there has been talk about whether some of the good shields could also act as a mask, but I don't think that's happening at present. It may in the future if we start to run out of everything. Um, one of the questions people haven't asked is, how come we don't all climb into our big white suits? And the answer there is that you will simply self-contaminate. The more PPE we ask you to put on, the higher the risk that you'll stuff up and self-contaminate. So the PPE has got to be minimal and you know that's not 100% effective, and that's called taking a risk when you're a healthcare worker. So we want you to minimise the risk, but we can never take it away completely. There will be that, that risk that you will get COVID looking after patients. There is that risk. Thanks, Mark. Thank you so much for your time tonight, Mark, and thank you for everyone who's joined us. Uh, mm. I'll just quickly end with a few final um, points here, if that's okay. Uh, now, uh, as you'll see on your screen here, this is the contact information for the practice support team at PHN. We're here to support you guys. So if there's anything that you need around COVID or anything else, please feel free to contact us at practice support at um, Or you can also um, have a look at our coronavirus uh, page at cespin.org.au and that's sort of all things COVID. Um, also, Mark Jennings' website is really great um, and full of some really good information. So um, feel free to, to jump on there. Um, the other thing as well for anyone who may have joined late in regards to the evaluation forms, they will be coming through fairly shortly. Um, and once you receive those um, within the next few days, please um, fill them out. And then about a fortnight, in about a fortnight's time, you should receive your certificate of attendance. Once you receive your certificate of attendance, um, you will also get some notes because obviously Mark's covered quite a lot of content tonight. So there's also some um, notes to complement her presentation today. So feel free um, to keep your eye out for that and then have a read through those when they come through. Um, and uh, finally, um, ma masks, as we mentioned earlier, the surgical masks are available through us here at the PHN. They're on our website to um, request them. Um, you just have to fit out, fill out an online form and request the masks that way and we can send some out to you pretty quickly. Alrighty, so thanks everyone again for your time tonight and apologies for the um, short delay earlier on, but I'm glad we managed to still finish on time. Um, and we hope to see you soon. All of our um, webinars are recorded, so you can watch them later um, or uh, have a look on our website as well for any uh, further upcoming webinars. So we hope to see you then. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.